Phoenix Rising left uh, some interesting comments on my previous video concerning Amor Fati and acceptance of fate and acceptance or rejection of fate. And what does it actually mean to accept your fate? Um, backing up a bit, I go over a lot of my sort of core metaphors a lot. I'll just explain another one. <laughs> has to do with um, my provisional view of what we are in terms of um, entities in the universe. Um, I tend to see us as an observer of um, outside information, um, of things happening external to us, and we are passing judgment. And as an illusion or not, we are participating, or we think we're participating in what's going on. Uh, it's often described in Hindu, or more specifically, tantric imagery, um, the vantage point, the, the sort of our position in the universe, as we're looking out at a monster with an open maw, and all these horrible things are coming out of the monster's mouth. All that that means is um, we can't control what's happening outside of us. We can't control that which is beyond our control. You get all your ducks in a row, and next thing you know, on the next block over, three 747s are crashing into the building on purpose. <laughs> uh, or the two buildings over there. Um, how do you prepare yourself for things like that? I don't think that you <laughs> realistically can. Um, so you have to sort of see that there are things out there that you can't really control. And the outside world is apparently unpredictable very unpredictable um, and what causes us to see um, the information stream or our place in the universe or in the cosmos as observing a monster with horrible things coming out of its mouth all these terrible shapes uh, in the stream of becoming uh, well I suppose that's simply the fear of the unknown right we don't if I knew concretely that I'm sitting here in this office tower and next to me is another office tower. If I know darn well that in one hour three 747s are going to crash into that office tower next to me, it's not going to have the same effect as if I'm not warned. <laughs> and it's that unknown that causes the fear. That unknown that causes the anxiety, I suppose, is more a more apt term, because if I'm staring that monster in the face, and I know that I'm staring the monster in the face, and there's a lot of things coming out of it at me, if there's 9-11s coming at me, if there's Paris attacks coming at me, if there's global warming coming at me, if there's uh, information overload coming at me, if I'm aware of this, it's going to affect me less than if I completely have no grasp of what's happening. Um, even knowing things that you can't know, even knowing that there are things out there that you can't know, is a certain species of certainty, or at least a provisional certainty. Knowing how much you don't know, or knowing that there is an enormous amount that you don't know, <laughs> uh, can help you deal with anxiety. Fear. Um, now, let's say that what your fate is, is whatever comes out of that monster's mouth. Um, whatever you can't change. Because, again, they, they say that it's a monster, but not everything that comes out of the monster's mouth is bad. You'll see this whenever you're sitting by yourself in an empty bar or something like this, and a gorgeous woman comes in and sits down right next to you and starts talking to you. And you get this odd feeling that this may be going somewhere. <laughs> um, that's complete blind improbable chance with you know in my in my case there's about as much chance of that happening as a bunch of 747s crashing into the building next to me <laughs> but it could happen um, but again I don't know these things are outside of my control they're outside even of my knowledge they're outside of my ability to reasonably predict I can't predict um, 9-11, and I can't predict a extremely rich, distant relative dying and leaving everything to me. Um, 
so our fate. Um, as I say, fate is that part of oneself, that part of one's totality, the experience of one's existence that one cannot change. That's how I would define fate. But do you know what that is? <laughs> um, do you know what you can't change? Do you know what the third part of the serenity prayer is? You know, um, God give me the courage to face the things I can't change, the wisdom to, or the whatever, fortitude to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Well, the third part's the tricky one, isn't it? <laughs> um, how do we know what we can and can't change? Uh, Epictetus starts off with um, a list of things in the Enchiridion that we can't change. Well, yeah, how exhaustive is it and how accurate is his list? And um, how do we know that we can't change things? And how do we know, you know, or how do we react to that which we can't change and can't even know um, in an unpredictable uh crazy universe like this one, uh, one could even say a mad universe like this one, how on earth do you tell the difference between that which you can change and that which you can't change? Anxiety. <laughs> Anxiety for whatever, whenever that, you know, whatever that monster is going to vomit into your face. Be it, an, you know, again, another 9-11 or simply a massive coronary with no warning uh, happening to you or someone close to you. Um, I would say that Amor Fati is more of an attitude towards that which you can't change. It's not an actual acceptance of certain things. It's an acceptance of the reality that there are things that you can't change. It's not accepting or rejecting the individual things. Um, the, 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 the objection is raised against Amor Fadi often, and it's a good objection, by the way. What if I have an existence that's intolerable? I've suffered from a major depression, and I would have to say that, and I have to agree with a lot of people who have gone through major depressions, if um, that were our only uh, reality is depression, then yes, suicide would make sense, but it isn't, or at least it isn't for everybody who goes through a major depression you can overcome it, or it sometimes just goes away of its own accord. Um, but it's a good objection, um, and it's a good illustration of a life that may not be worth living. But the problem is, of course, let's say you're going to act on that belief that my depression is incurable. Okay, go ahead. There's Again, I was talking about being in a building. All i got to do is open the window over there and step out, and that's that. But at the end of the day, I don't know if my depression is going to get better. <laughs> uh, if I'm in the middle of it, you can tell right now I'm not. Um, but let's say that, you know, I accept the fact that it may come back. It may come back and it may stay back. It may be another one of those horrific things that comes out of the monster's maw. Um, what do I make of the fact that that may be what life has in store for me? <laughs> Um, an important distinction to make between that which, you know, when, when you accept certain things, you have to accept that which is, which is inevitable, and you have to do that, or try to change that, which is changeable. Uh, that kind of has its own set of problems, but <laughs> um, for the purposes of Amor Fati, I would say that it's more of an attitude than, or more of a tool than an actual prescription as to how to deal with the actual events of one's life. It's not saying that um, I will accept this, this, this in my life because I've concluded that I can't change it. It's just a general attitude that says what you can't change, you may as well endure. Um, again, you've got to be careful because that can become quite vacuous because you end up sort of thinking, okay, well, since I can't know one way or the other, then now what do I do? You don't have to be sure to act. And I would say that Amor Fati is a form of active, um, active thinking, proactive thinking, as opposed to reactive thinking. Um, 
I don't have to know what's in the next five seconds of my life to actually act. In fact, it's almost impossible for me not to act. Uh, arguably, it is impossible for me to, act, to not to act. Uh, but action seems to be built right into this. Existence. So, you know, like Krishna says to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, try to not act Arjuna and watch. <laughs> See how far that gets you. But now, you have to act. What are you going to do? You don't like what's in your immediate future, what looks like it's in your immediate future. And <laughs> um, get busy living or get busy dying, right? And, the, uh, of course, the lesson of it all is you can actually cope with the craziness or the unpredictability of the universe. It's not easy. And all the work is internal, but it can be done.